Welcome to the Ask the Expert panel. Here we have Sam Coxon, uh, Ironman legend. He's done eight half Ironmans at 70.3. He's done one of the full Ironmans. He qualified for the All World Athletes. He got the gold. Uh, he qualified for Nice. Do you want to tell us a bit more about yeah, that's what right. Done? Uh, nice. So this year, 2019, it's the World Championships. Uh, so I was lucky enough to qualify in Weymouth um, and got fifth in my age group, I think. Uh, so I was lucky at the roll down ceremony and took the slot for Nice in September. So yeah, I was pretty happy about that. So we are here to quiz Sam. All those niggling questions, all those little things that are bugging you as an Ironman newbie, whether you're new to the event or it's your second time of the event, it's just those little niggling questions. We're gonna milk Sam for Ironman knowledge. Oh. Let's do it. <laughs> Do you want to ask the expert something? Yeah, so we've, as I say, we've got Sam Coxon here. You can uh, follow him on Instagram, check out all these pictures. It's Sam Cox Troy on Instagram. Sam Cox and Troy, yeah. yeah. We'll put the uh, the link below so you can uh, check out his Instagram. He's the PT who actually got me to do a full Ironman. And I suppose he's the actually seedling of this channel because before <laughs> that, I was, uh, you know, four and a half stone heavier. Yeah. Got me into fitness, got me to do an Ironman 70.3 literally is the only reason that I managed to get through it, help me through it. About a year ago, wasn't it? From it now? was, yeah. It was about 12, 12 months yeah. ago now that I started. Come a long way. That's it, yeah. And now here we are, running the channel. And Whaley, now this year, is doing his first one. Yes, I am. Yeah. So we've got the expert to ask here. And me, as a still a newbie, and those niggling questions as a first time Ironman 70.3 trier are still in my, fresh in my mind. So between us, we're going to answer any questions that Whaley and Cooper, and any ones I remember, we might have. Let's go into it. So Sam, the day before the actual Ironman, yeah. what should I be eating? Um, what I'd recommend, the best thing from previous experience, is to not change anything that you'd usually eat before you go out to train. Um, so me personally would probably have some rice or pasta, something that's going to be high in carbohydrates, um, and that's going to release into your system slowly. It's probably not a good idea to go out for a big curry the night before okay. um, and maybe eat too much than you usually would. People often think that they have to eat lots and lots and lots, um, but often that's not, not the way to do it. Um, so don't eat anything out of the ordinary that your body's not used to. Yeah. Um, eat something that's easily digestible um, and that your body's gonna, gonna thank you for. So not too many high fibrous vegetables because you, your body can't, can't it'll maybe store onto it a little bit and it might make you need the toilet. Okay. Um, so something like pasta, rice, um, couscous, maybe some potatoes, bit of fish, a um, bit of protein as well for muscle recovery afterwards. Um, and then, yeah, you shouldn't go wrong. What about the vegetarians and the vegans for protein in that, in that respect? Because you, you are a no meat athlete, aren't you? Yeah, 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 for two years now. Yeah, so um, yeah, I didn't eat any meat or, or dairy or cheese or anything like that. So I've actually found that my stomachs and, and bowel movements have become better since not eating meat. Um, so I, I feel as though I'd, I'd take a while to digest digest meat and I definitely wouldn't recommend eating it the night before. Um, but I mean, for me personally, I eat a lot of chickpeas and vegetables and obviously with your rice and pasta and potatoes, you do get protein in there as well and ample amounts. I mean, we're not trained to be bodybuilders, so we don't need as much protein as, as people think. Yeah. Um, our main source of fuel, in my opinion, is, is carbohydrates for fuel. Uh, but, but different people think different things, but it's just what, what you find best. I see. Along the route, mm. checkpoints. Uh, yeah. So sort of fueling along the route, if we talk from swim to bike to... Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you look, uh, when you get your email, um, it will probably come, they often change it, maybe about three weeks, four weeks before the race, it will tell you um, where all the checkpoints are along the way, so where all the pit stops are. It will tell you what food they've got, what type of gels, where they've got bananas, coke, um, any of it I think is the energy um, that they use, the, like the, the powders that they just fill up with water. So it will say it may be every 10 miles, it may be every 15 or it, it change on the course um, and that will be the same on the run as well. I so see. generally I take two bottles. Um, in a half Ironman sometimes you can get away if it's quite cold with just two. If it's warmer, then I'll grab one, chuck my one in the drop zone, and then grab another one and replace it in the frame. And uh, obviously in terms of the run, they offer you electrolytes as well, mm. and the Cokes, I mean, and there's a, there's a Red Bull yeah. there. 
What would you suggest on terms of you know taking the coke and the and the, um, the, the electrolytes? How often? Rule of is not don't take the coke. Coca Cola. <laughs> Coca Cola. Um, yeah, so I don't usually take any cups on the bike. Usually it's just bottles that they pass to you. Yeah. But on the run, especially when your energy levels start to drop, um, every twenty minutes I'd have a gel, um, and then every so often if I was suffering, I'd have a, a quick um, little cup of coke. By the time you kind of get it in your mouth, you probably only get a sip anyway because they put that much in there so it doesn't spill everywhere and it's diluted down. But a bit of sugar in your system will make the world of a difference when you really need it. And in this instance, is littering okay? Can you just be like, you know, I'm done with that? Yeah, usually you try and get it as close to the bin as you can. So, um, Not on the bike. Like on the bike, put it, you know, you can get done for the littering. Yeah. Put it in your bag. If, if it's outside of the drop zones, usually they have like 100 metres before the, the feed station, the 100 metres after. Yeah. If you drop it outside of that and you get caught, then you'll get a straight disqualification. Okay, so, so you have it's a... It's got to be in that drop zone. Yeah. In the drop zone. Yeah, okay. It can't be in the middle of kind of chase on the staff side, man, and, yeah. just, and just throw yeah, it at yeah. a competitor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> knock him off. Yeah. Question. James what, has a question. What if you do need to have a poo? While you're <laughs> yeah, because to... you just reminded me, when Cooper, when he eats cheese, yeah. like I can set my watch 15 minutes <laughs> and be in the toilet, honestly. Beneath the toilet, yeah. You just yeah. go straight through him. Yeah. And also um, on my last run, I had to finish a little bit early because I was dying oh for no. a poo. That's yeah. a good question. What yeah. if we need a We've poo? Been, yeah. um, well, I've actually had the same issue myself quite a few times. Um, so there's different portaloos around the course, generally more on the bike, on the run, sorry. Um, on the bike course, you may, if you're really desperate, have to stop and jump in a bush. So do a bit of a Paula Radcliffe. Is that, is that yeah. <laughs> fine or anything if you were to stop and have a little tinkle or a, a poop? If you, a get, if you get caught, they probably wouldn't be happy. Um, but like in decent exposure, they're quite kind of tight on that nowadays. Yeah. Um, so you're supposed to have your top zipped up all the time and not supposed to strip off and that kind of stuff. But I think if you're really desperate and you go enough far enough into the bush, you should, should get away with it. But if not, if you can find a portal, then, yeah. then that would be the way to go. There's never any toilet paper in any portal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, a good leaf, big I leaf. I have a fear of this of them, someone tipping it over and getting blue in the <laughs> I think that leads us on to another question that uh, <clears throat> I remember was niggling at me when I started. Is Ironman etiquette? Right. So you mentioned about you know you've got to have your top zipped up. Yeah. And I know there's certain things about you can't be in a slipstream. So just yeah. want to tell us a little bit about. Ironman etiquette. Okay. Um, when disqualification and kind of etiquette is a little bit different, I'd start with disqualification. Yeah. Um, generally in the swim, there's not really too much you can do wrong other than start missing out boys. Yeah, um, just go straight. <laughs> start missing boys. There'll usually be a kayak that will come over and kind of direct you in the right route because often people do kind of zigzag a little bit and if they're disorientated then they may find that difficult. Um, if maybe if you do the swim without a wetsuit, they probably won't let you start if it's wetsuit mandatory. So is it short that. sleeve or short? Is it? Do you have to have a long sleeve or long leg wetsuit? Um, it depends what they say. Uh, you'll generally get an email the night before. I mean, staffs for sure is going to be a wetsuit, but if you're racing abroad, so it doesn't matter if you've got short sleeve wetsuit or long sleeve wetsuit. I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. Actually, it's probably one one yeah. question I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I, generally, I, long sleeve. I've seen yeah. everybody in long sleeve ones. So yeah. I presume, and you've always wore a long sleeve. One. Yeah, and I think long sleeves you get more buoyancy from a wetsuit anyway, so it's going to make you float a little bit higher in the water. So if you are susceptible to sinking, then a long sleeve and long leg <laughs> wetsuit is probably going to be better. Cooper is quite susceptible. To <laughs> so going on to when you take, for example, your wetsuit off. Yeah. Um, should you be wearing like sun cream or anything like that to protect you from the sun if it's a uh, you know middle of June or whatever? David, you had a funny experience with that, didn't you? Once we were swimming at Chase Water. Yeah. Um, if you've got a head like mine, yeah. <laughs> do not put sun cream on your head because you'll lose before your hat. you put your <laughs> swim cap on. Yeah. Because you'll end up looking like <laughs> you know when you've just been on the job and you've had uh, some protection on and then it goes a bit flaccid afterwards <laughs> and you've still got the protection on it just looks like that it's on the end dome. of my head yeah <laughs> if you have got a bald head don't shave your head yeah day before do it a couple of days before so you've got a bit of velcro yeah and uh don't put the sun cream on your head before the swim put it on afterwards yeah. with a spray yeah spray is nice and quick isn't it mm. i mean if you do have a bald head do you have to wear a swim cap? I don't see the point in thinking yes. so. Yeah. It's yeah. so that they can see you. I know this, I can answer exactly. this. It's so that they can see you in the water. Oh, okay. And also, you get a coloured swim hat for your age group as well. Oh, and also, okay. they do a gold Ironman hat for people that 
A golden? A golden. Oh, well, athlete. And I saw, actually, I probably shouldn't put this on YouTube. No, yeah, you should. He stole one, and he's got one at home. He saw it lying around. There was a table of them, and I just thought, well, they're, they're freebies for people, so I had one. And then he said, I've got one of the free hats, and I said, that's one of the professional ones. There's probably some poor guy who couldn't start, because you've got his bloody... Hat. Caption, will the fit does not condone stealing. Yeah, they're not free. If you see them lying around <laughs> on the table and you're an idiot, they're not free. <laughs> Sam, during the swim, uh, when I've seen videos, it looks like it's just chaos. Mm. It looks like um, it's just waves and all you can see is white and everything. I mean, what do we do? Washing machine, yeah, washing. they call it. It, it looked like a washing machine. Yeah, it's mental. That's what they call it. Yeah, it can be like overwhelming to start with, um, but the best advice I can give is get open water swimming so go down to chase water go to your local lake where they do open water swimming as yeah. organized events on saturdays whatever and just get in the water get amongst other people um on the day it will be a steady flow they might start three people off every five seconds three people off three people off so although it looks like chaos it shouldn't be as bad as it looks on camera so when you're in close but what i would say is probably take a little path off to the side not too far but just kind of offset so that you're not getting hit because that can often ruin your rhythm as you're swimming along. If you someone's clipping your toes, yeah. you stop, and then you might take on a bit of water. So I'd, I'd recommend just trying to get a little bit of clear water and just try and keep the speed up, keep the momentum going. That advice really helped me that you gave me because with my start, they didn't do the stagger because there was fog in the morning. Yeah. If you remember, it was a late start. So everybody just went in. I remember that. And I remember Sam saying, go to the side, find your own space if you're worried. So I did, went to the right. And you can see other people was doing it as well. Yeah. Found my own space, got my own comfort, and just enjoyed the swim yeah. round. And I still did it in like 38, yeah. 37 minutes, something like that. The key is to come out the swim not using too much energy, not burning too many of your matches. Um, and you can often get quite kind of caught up in the swim, take on a bit of water, or maybe lose your goggles. But the key is just to keep, keep kind of calm and just get through it. And when you're on the bike, you know you're going to be comfortable and you know the route and not really too much can go wrong. Another tip I would say before is, you can get this like anti-steam stuff to put in your goggles, like because your goggles can get steamed up quite easy with the heat and so forth. Yeah. Put some of that in before you, before the event, like that morning. Just put anti-steam in your goggles, <laughs> get them on ready, get your swim cap on, ready, and and you'll be sorted. Another question off the back of that: Would you recommend goggles inside or outside of swim cap? Um, I'd always put them outside. Some people wear two caps, so they'll put one cap on, put the goggles on, and then put their, the Iron Man cap on over the top. Um, yeah. It's personal preference. If you've got a bald head, I put it on inside because I found the hat stuck on better. Oh, grips. Because yeah. the goggles would actually push the hat up yeah. like that right. with the tension. Okay. Whereas if I put the goggles on the inside and then the cap afterwards, yeah. the goggles gripped to my head and then the hat was almost gripped to the goggles. So again, bald yeah, man tips. Idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How different is the indoor swim to an outdoor swim? Because obviously at the moment it's the winter, I just ran here in the snow. I can answer that for you. There's yeah. fish outside. <laughs> fish and yeah, big fish and sharks. In terms um, of actual the, the, the swim? Yeah, um, it's quite a lot different to be honest. I mean you haven't got the comfort of knowing that it's only a metre deep or a metre and a half deep. You've got waves to take into account, wind, other people. Um, so. As I said, the best advice I can give is get out there and just get used to it. Even put your head underneath the water, get a bit of water down in the back of your wetsuit, see what it feels like. You may find that you enjoy it more, being outside and being in the fresh air. And I always feel it's a bit more of an accomplishment when I've done a big loop outside around the boys rather than just swimming up and down in the pool. That was weird for me. Like When I first, I was terrified of the open water swimming, even though I've done surfing and things in the past. For yeah. some reason, I think it was the cold of the water and everything that, I was frightened to go out yeah. into the open water and it was a real sort of instant fear thing for me to begin with. But going out to uh, our local one is Chase Water, they've got the trainers there, really helpful. Just went out to the boy and back. And then within a couple of weeks I was loving it and then yeah. after the event I was going voluntarily because yeah. I just loved that open water swimming. It soon comes on and to begin with they give you like these boys that you can carry with you, you know, like that you can hold on to. So I had one of them tied to my legs, all kinds of worried, but then like <laughs> Literally, after a couple of weeks, it just went. So did you prefer that to the actual indoor swimming? Loads more now, yeah. yeah. yeah I prefer the outdoor swimming. If I had the choice and it was, if the water was at a nice temperature, like 18 degrees plus, I'd always go uh, open water, mm -hmm. definitely, every time.
So if you have the opportunity, do open water as part of your training. Not, yeah. Don't just stick to a swim. Definitely. Yeah. I, I'd say 100% do open water. I think it would really affect you if you didn't. If yeah. you just did a pool and then went straight to an Ironman open water swim. He'll struggle. I think both personally, both mentally and physically, it would have affected me. Yeah, definitely. Because also you've got a wetsuit and you are, weirdly, you're so much faster in a wetsuit. Yeah. Like, you're more you're more buoyant. And I remember you telling me this, and I thought, that sounds a bit counter, you know, intuitive, but, but you float more in the yeah. wetsuit and you you just glide along. Yeah. So your time in the open water in a wetsuit will be faster than your time in the pool as well. Yeah. 2XU wetsuits are the ones to go for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 2XU so, is a good... Like chafing. Okay. What do you do to prevent it and what can you do to kind of ease the chafing? I will always use Sudocrem. Um, so drop my pants before, yeah. smear it all around, <laughs> just get covered in the stuff. Everywhere. All around in the bits that are moving. Yeah. Um, maybe put some Vaseline around your neck. Either Vaseline or you can get some decent Definitely stuff. Definitely for the... Swim. Swim. Yeah. I mean, for, for the, obviously the groin area. Yeah. Vaseline, uh, sorry, um, Sudocrem. Yeah, pseudocreme yeah. all around. It yeah. it goes quite quickly, you'll be surprised. So I put it on once and, and generally it will get free. You're always probably going to get a little bit of chafe. Yeah. But I'd recommend testing out your tri suit and your wetsuit and whatever you're going to race another day beforehand. Yeah. Um, because the, the worst thing to do is to use it on the race day, having never used it before. And yeah. you find a, a, a horrible seam that just doesn't sit right and it just rubs and chafes. So that's, that's not going to be good. But yeah. pseudocreme is the way to go and then Vaseline around your neck. I'd recommend. So yeah, last year I used uh, that chamois cream yeah, that I got from like wiggle.co.uk. Yeah. And it likes, because in your tri suit, you have like padding. Yeah. So you rub it on the padding rather than on yourself. And then it absorbs, the padding is like made to absorb this Where's chamois the padding? cream. In your, in, your, in your groin area. Is it's, that for the bike? Is for it? the bike, yeah. Oh, but you'll, yeah. you'll have it all, in, in a tri suit, you'll have, it's made for like the bike. You, you it's made to wear under a wetsuit. Yeah. So you'll take off your wetsuit. You've already got it on, and it's got the padding on for the bike. But then it's not too much padding, so you can still run with it as well. Yeah. And I'll put that chamois cream all on that, and that really helped. Do you know what I mean? I had no chafing at all. Yeah. Throughout it, and then the worst thing for me was when I started going into uh, open water swimming, I come up with real red raw marks. I remember saying to you, and you and Sam said, just put Vaseline. Yeah, around you. And that's from the wetsuit, was it? That's from the yeah. wetsuit. Yeah, just the rubbing of the wetsuit. What do we do about transporting our bikes to the venues? And uh, because the the Staffordshire one is obviously the, the the bike is in one area and your running is in another area. Yeah. So what, what, how does that all happen? So on the Thursday, I think you can. It changes Thursday to Friday. If the race is on the Sunday, usually I'd always drop my bike off on the Saturday. Um, so I'll go for a little ride in the morning, make sure the bike's all good to go, the gears are working, the brakes are working. Should you um, have it serviced perhaps? Yeah. A, a day or two before? Maybe like a couple of weeks before, yeah, to so make sure it's done. Just tell me you're doing a race and I'll give it a once over and make sure it's all looking good. Yeah, I've done a week before. Yeah. And then used it afterwards just to be sure. Yeah. Because yeah. often if when you transport with the bike, sometimes you can knock things and, and various bits and bobs can go loose. So just make sure you put the wheels in. Once you're happy with it, you rack your bike. Um, so to go backwards, you have to register first. You have to get your wristband and your race number and you get a big envelope with, with all of the bits that you need and your, your hat as well that you're swimming. Put your race number on, your little bands, go to transition with your bike. They check your bib number. You have to wear your helmet as well when you're going to transition. You rack your bike. Um, once you're happy with the positioning, I would um, just have a little walk up and down, familiarise yourself with where your bike is so you know. That was really useful for me because... As you come out in the swim, you've got a peg with your number on. Yeah. Where you hang your that bag, haven't you? Then you've got your bike, but there's because it's like wall to wall bikes. So I went in. Remember where my peg was? That it was in the middle row. You know, what I mean, just don't like visually. So I remember it's like opposite that door in yeah. the middle. Don't try and remember what number it is because when you get there, there'll be hundreds of bags. Yeah. So visually opposite that blue door in the middle, roughly, so you can roughly go to it. Yeah. And then as you go out, again, I remembered, right, my bike is opposite those big spotlights, three rows in. Yeah. So visually, I could right go, there's the big spotlights, run to the big spotlights, three rows in, and then you know your bike is roughly there. So if you get that in your mind the day before. And then I also filmed it, so I filmed myself walking outside so I could watch it again and just mentally 
visualize that transition. And then when I come out, I literally was right straight to my peg and I could see other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Around Getting lost. Yeah. I was straight there, straight out to the bike. Yeah, saves you a lot of time. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. What would happen if someone accidentally took your bike? Um, I guess they they could do. They couldn't take it you at the end else's. of an event because they check all your numbers and stuff. Um, oh, you've got a number race, on your bike, haven't you? Someone, yeah, someone could wheel your bike out, and then you'd be screwed. <laughs> That'd be interesting. So they send all the tags today before you have to put a sticker on your helmet. Yeah. A sticker on your bike. Yeah. Uh, what your other bib, things have you got? Your bib. Yeah, your, your bib. You've got a tattoo as well. Two yeah. tattoos, one for your arm, one for your leg. You don't have to wear those though, that's just that choice. And a race belt is always useful. Because yeah. it, you, your bib clips onto it. Yeah. And you can tuck gels into it. Mm. So then yeah, if it's in your bag out of the swim, you can just take that out, clip it round, and you're good to go. You're not waiting, ready. pinning on your... Yeah. Because you don't, you can't wear your bib under the wetsuit. Obviously. No. Yeah. The other option is to put the gels on your bike. Um, so once you rack your bike, I wouldn't put anything on it because potentially someone could tamper with it during the night or other people racking their bikes or knock it. So in the morning of the race, you'd go back to your bike again and attach whatever you want to put on your bike, your Garmin, your bottles, your gels. With the gels, what, just a bit of tape or? I just use uh, electrical tape and, and put one on and then put one over the top, then one over the top, depends how many you want. I usually take four or five on the bike with me. Um, but that'll be something that you kind of learn in training with, with how many you need on the race. Once you've done your bike, you need to go to Stafford um, and drop your run kit off. So you'll have a blue bag. Or wherever your event is. Blue bag, no, red yeah. bag. You'll have a red bag, which you drop off yeah, at the, at the run start. So that when you finish your bike, you come in into transition, you rack your bike, go to the peg, grab your number, take all your bike kit off, put your running stuff on, and then off you go and hang your, your red bag back up with your cycling kit in. So as a summary, as you come out the swim, it's your blue bag. Because it's water. And in your blue bag, you will have your helmet with your sticker on, uh, sunglasses, if it's gonna be a hot day, your race shoes, and your bib with your number on, and on a race belt preferably, so it's easy to clip on. Yeah. And that's pretty much the content of your, your, your bag ready to get on the bike, I'd say. And then as you get off the bike, it's the red bag, yeah, and in the red bag you would have just your running trainers and a bottle of water. Uh, so whatever you need for the run is just going to be in that red bag. Yeah. Maybe a cap and a visor. That's your lot. That's your lot. And the other, and the other bag is the white bag, which yeah. if you haven't got anybody with you, you can stick stick all your stuff in at the beginning before the swim, hang it up on the truck, and it'll be there waiting for you at the end. Yeah. If you needed that. Transitions summarised. Easy piece bags. How newbie friendly are the Ironmans? Are they prepared for it? Um, yeah, I think they're. you've got to obviously be prepared yourself, um, but they know that there's going to be very good people and there's going to be people that it's their first time, so they'll often make you feel quite comfortable. They'll put you at ease straight from the start as well. And a lot of the time they've changed the events, uh, the swim start, so that they start in a staggered rather than everybody going off in a mass start. For newbies, that can be quite kind of overwhelming so yeah it, definitely it, it is a mix fine mixture isn't it you know from experience I, there's a lot of things that you have to research yourself but then there's a lot of things that are really helpful with like the courses you know what i mean they're, they're all clearly signposted open you know where you're going as you go through the run you get the different colored bands for each lap you've done because it's a lap run the the staff's one that you're doing so you get like a I can't remember if it's a green band and then a blue band and then a red band, something like that. But you know, once you've got that last band, and even the people handing the band will say, last one, and you go in the, la there's three lanes, each lap, there's lane one, lane two, lane three, depending on which one you want. So if you're on lap one, you go in one lane. If you're on lap two, you go in number two. And when you're on your third lap, you go in lap three, they give you that band. And then as you're coming around the course, you can see that way is to the finish, or that way it would be to carry on lapping. Lap, yeah. And once you've yeah. got that band on, you straight through to that. So it's very mm -hmm. uh, user friendly, yeah. Yeah. orientated in terms of not getting lost, you know, what lap yeah. am I on and, and where have I got to go, that sort of thing. I mean, I think that is my probably biggest concern is um, it being my first time, where do I go? Yeah. Is there going to be like an elitist kind of atmosphere there or is it more of a fun atmosphere? Oh, it's Definitely such a fun, fun. Yeah. yeah. All the, the, the people, the commentators there are, are there to make you feel one safe is always Iron Man's first priority, but two, so you have everybody have fun. And they want people to finish as well, so 
they'll give you the best possible support they can do to, to help you along as well. So, yeah, it's a really it's a well well run event. Probably the best event I've ever ev events I've ever done. Yeah, it is so well run. organized. Like, I was yeah. just shocked by that, and the amount of people out and the amount of support. That's the one thing I took away from it. Yeah, the amount of supporters. Along the route, there was, you know, some guys dragged a couch out and they got a couple of beers just <laughs> in the middle of kind of chase. This was in the middle of the woods, yeah. just cheering you on. You know, grannies outside the house ringing bells for you, <laughs> kids reaching out for high fives. Yeah. It was just so well supported, which is why I'm really looking forward this year. I mean, cheer coming and cheering for you. Did you yeah. find that that support kind of helped you? That's what kept me going. Kept yeah. you going. And one thing I read in the magazine actually was keep smiling. I think if you run with a smile and you go with a smile, it's all just that mental state that you are. And smile at them and say hi to them and they're shouting to you, come on, and, and you know, just give them a high fives and just get involved with that. And that, I think that's probably what fueled me through it and kept me going. Yeah. Because I struggled on the run. Yeah. And I kept thinking, I want to stop. But I think that's really what pushed me through was the support. Yeah, definitely. The kit you need, you know, pricing of your tri suit. Uh, wetsuit what kind of kit what does Wayne need, need to prepare for himself um i'd always go straight from the start so think about the swim the bike the run individually um you don't need all singing or dancing wetsuits tri suits helmets that kind of stuff if it's your first one i mean some people even ride in trainers um but to go from the start so you need a wetsuit you need goggles you need a hat those are the main three key points um for the bike to go from the top you need a helmet Sunglasses aren't essential, but they would be recommended if it's going to be sunny. Don't fly in the eye, slow me down either. Yeah, exactly. Um, you need a tri suit. So I don't know if there's rules and regulations for tri suits. You can pretty much wear whatever you want as long as you're covered up, um, but it's got to be something that's comfortable for you. So you can get a tri suit anywhere from kind of forty pounds on Wiggle or um, a different triathlon website. There's there's plenty around. Um, going down. Um, a decent pair of cycling shoes as well, which are your right size with the cleats on that obviously fit your pedals that are on your bike. Moving on to the bike, anything that's that's safe, that you, you feel comfortable on, you can ride, um, that you know you're going to do the bike course fast enough in to make the cut off. Um, and obviously with, with plenty of experience riding that bike as well. How much should you spend on a bike? Because bikes can be a couple hundred pounds to ten thousand pounds. Yes, yeah. it depends what your budget is. Um, what would you say that the kind of like the minimum spend would be for uh, you know a bike? I'd say five hundred pounds. I'd probably say so. Go into your local bike shop. They'll probably they'll point you in the right direction. Um, they'll ask you what your budget is. There's, you don't need to get a triathlon specific bike for an Ironman. I'd say eighty five percent of people there will have triathlon bikes with the bars on the front, which are more aerodynamic. Um, but if it's your first one, you just want to finish it. If that's your goal then a road bike is definitely suitable, 500 pounds. Um, yeah, and you should be good. And then going on to the run, uh, a decent pair of trainers, you've done some miles in. Um, make sure they fit you, make sure they support you. Um, they're the right size, they're not rubbing, chafing in any places. Uh, if you need orthotics, I know you said one of your legs is longer than the other, so that might be something that you need to balance out. Um, but that all comes with, with practice and training as well. Um, and then lastly, probably just a decent running cap. Yeah, and then, then you're good to go. So I, I reckon you can get everything for a thousand pounds. I'd yeah. say. I just want to add in there: having one leg that's slightly longer than the other <laughs> is very common. In fact, I think it's something like within four millimeters is standard. If you say so. That's, <laughs> what, that's yeah. what I googled. <laughs> I think you're right. Think Am you're I right. normal? <laughs> <laughs> Another point on uh, expenditure with the bike. I went into a shop, which I won't, won't name first of all, and they tried to sell me a four grand bike. I told them it was my first Ironman. Yeah. I then went into, uh, if you are from Staffordshire, local run and ride, absolutely awesome guys. Matt there, absolutely brilliant. Didn't try and sell me a four grand bike. He said, if it's your first Ironman, this is what you need. And I think it cost me about 800 pounds for the bike. And he said, if you wanted to then upgrade it, you could buy these extra wheels in the future. So in the, I went back then and bought like the lightweight wheels, which probably cost about another 400, 500 quid for the lightweight wheels. They're yeah. so, um do you saddle height for you as well so to make yeah. sure that he sells the white length and he's done iron man himself he was super helpful and so you know just don't go and believe the first thing that you told in a bike shop yeah and that bike's been absolutely amazing for me yeah. did the trick uh, he even gave me the advice of 
riding in the, the the original wheels and putting the light weight wheels on a bit near the time for the race. Yeah, so then I'd practiced harder and it felt like I needed an upgrade because yeah. you know I was, I was going quicker. That's good. Yeah. So yeah. shop around. Shop around. Don't take the first salesman that tries to sell you a four grand bike. Yeah. 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 Uh, and if you are from the Staffordshire area, go and check out the guys that run and ride. They also, do, I think it's, it's good to note, they also do um, an analysis so they can hook you up to a machine and do all these sensors and make sure you're riding at the yeah, right efficiency. Yeah, I have to, they put me in front of this screen and I've stood on this thing and they worked out the right bike size for me and everything yeah. like that. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And they'll put you on the treadmill as well and do your running analysis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like yeah you the right yeah. So, the Ironman's, you know, it's a big event. Yeah. How much training should you put in beforehand? Yeah. In terms of maybe months? And yeah. should he use a PT, obviously like yourself, it was recommended from me to Whaley. Or you could be coached by Body Performance Methods, which is the new coaching company I'm working for. Oh, I see why you came up. Uh, <laughs> 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 take, take it off, Sam. Just, just take it yeah. off. Just get that there plug all out there. Everybody can and see it now. And now he's going to show his guns off as well. Yeah, we'll put a link in I'm, the... I'm uh, runner's arms like you. <laughs> we'll, we'll put a link down in the comments section as well, just so you can uh, check it out. This is it. So yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, Dave, you went from January to the event, so you did it in six months, didn't you? Yeah, six months. I had, I'd done a little bit of swimming before myself, because I just started going once or twice a week swimming. Yeah. Not very good at it, just doing breaststroke. Yeah. I hadn't done any running, and I'd done a bit of mountain biking. Yeah. So that was my level of fitness, and I was 16 and a half stone at the yeah. time. The day of the event, I was 12 stone. Yeah. And that was... Massive. Thanks to Sam. So, yeah. I'd say get a PT yeah. if you want to get a good time and you want to do it seriously. Mm. But obviously there are training plans out there that you can probably find online. Yeah. But I think yeah, I'd recommend a PT. Yeah. But what would you with, say? with the training, I'd say you can go from kind of not having any experience to finishing the event in six months, I'd say. As long as you're willing to put the time in to train, um, maybe up to five times a week uh, will be optimal. For the 70.3, you can get away with slightly lower volumes of training than your full Ironman. Um, but as long as you're doing a couple of swims, a couple of bikes, and a couple of runs a week, you shouldn't have any problems. I suppose it boils down to your current level of fitness. Like yeah. My level of fitness was real low. Yeah. But some people might you know, already be running two yeah. times, three times a week, and it's their next step. So. Exactly. So it will all depend on where you're at. But the good thing about having a coach, they'll, they'll do some basic tests for you first. So they'll test your bike, your run, and your swim, see where your current level's at see where you potentially need to work on and they'll guide you and, and direct you. The That's what I found room. really useful. Yeah. yeah. And I'd def if you do get a PT, I'd rec definitely recommend getting somebody who has done an Ironman mm. because Sam was just absolute wealth of knowledge, all, all the questions yeah. and, and positioning on my bike and everything for the day. Was, yeah, it's important. What does PT stand for? Personal trainer. Oh, right. I was going to try and max him up then, Dave. I couldn't think of anything on the spot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought it was like physical. Teacher or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of PA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, six months I'd say. So you touched on commitment. Mm. Um, you know, we're not all uh, athletes. You know, some, for example. Speak for yourself. On the <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know Coop is an athlete now. <laughs> uh, like I'm a dad. Uh, I run a business. I'm a local politician. How do I kind of cope with that and fit it all in? What are you laughing at? Local politician. <laughs> Where do you do that? I'm a councillor. I'm a councillor. I'm a local councillor. Oh, <laughs> Vote for way. They will just plug it on the show. <laughs> Vote for him to pick up the no, You pay him, come on. <laughs> Votes and PT sessions. Um, so yeah, commitment. Um, so yeah, it can, it can be done as long as you can put aside an hour a day. Um, some people like to train early in the morning, some people like to get it done after the kids have gone to bed. Depends on your work, um, but if you're working with someone closely, they can tell you, or you can tell them when you've got time available, what you can do, whether you work till 9pm on a Wednesday, just don't do anything on a Wednesday. Um, if you know you've got a lot more time in the day on a Monday, you can get to the pool, then that's when your pool session will be. So it's just about finding what works for you, and that's, that's the, the unique thing about coaching. Everybody's completely different. People are coming in at different levels, they've got time commitments, they've got kids, jobs, whatever. So um, as long as you can hit those key sessions, then whenever you can do it in the day, it doesn't doesn't necessarily matter. I think I can sort of help there as well, because I was in the exact same experience. You know, I've got a young son, a business owner, not a politician, <laughs> but 
you know that t and that that time commitment sam would give me uh my training plan what to do that week so each week i'd either get up early do it in the morning so i drop my son to nursery and then i'd go and do it in the morning i'd either do my swims at a lunchtime so i wouldn't you know even though i, I wouldn't business work for myself i try not to take the mick I'd, so i just wouldn't have a lunch that day i'd go and do my my lunch would be my swim and then eating while i work or of an evening, especially when the nights get lighter. Uh, once my son had gone to bed, half seven, eight o'clock, running of an evening. So you can, there's always time. It's that time that you're either sitting, playing on an app, mm. that you're sitting watching Coronation Street, or that you're having that lying in bed. Yeah, you can fit it in. Yeah, no he excuses. He was an alien hunter at the time as well. I was. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't a politician. I was. A, <laughs> Move on, field, field 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 on field investigator. Move on field That's another story. The truth is out there. If someone misses, yeah. for example, uh, one session one day, can they put two together on, on, on another day? Like do two sessions a day? Do they miss one? Yeah, potentially. Um, You'll get to brick sets as well, won't you? At some point, so yeah. you will be doing two sets a day. Eventually, it will it'll build up to a run off the bike um, just to get your body used to, to doing that. Um, but or if, you, or if you're going open water swim, you might go open water swim and then take your bike with you and go afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What I would recommend is not backing too many sessions up, so always put it past your coach because they may have plans. For instance, if you skip a hard ride on Tuesday and do it on Wednesday and you've got another hard ride on Thursday, you won't have that time to recover then. So the sessions are planned at that specific time um to to offer you ample amounts of recovery. And I've stuck to session. some sessions vigorously, but I might just move them around. So like. If there was a swim and a run one day and I knew they'd probably both make the same effort, but I couldn't have my lunch that day to do a swim, I'd yeah, yeah. chop and change. Chop them around and miss a couple for illness or going to weddings. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up too yeah. much about that, but don't take the piss as well. Yeah. Oh, I can miss this one. Oh, because one becomes two, becomes three. Excuses. Becomes, yeah. yeah. Becomes a spiral. Yeah. And when it comes to the race day, once, you, once you're actually doing the event, you, and you want to be fit and you want to feel like you can actually finish it and you're going to enjoy it a lot more if you're at that kind of level yeah. if you're worrying that you haven't put the time in beforehand training then that's going to constantly play in your mind as well yeah so my first goal when i first started was to finish within yeah. the eight hour that was it finish yeah because i hadn't done anything then it became i found out your first 70.3 was to, uh, considered a good time within, within seven hours so then when i started to get fitter my new goal become do it within seven hours yeah uh, and that was still my goal by the time I come to it. And then on the day, I did it in six hours 20 Yeah. Uh, for my first one. And I just wouldn't have been able to do that at all with if I'd have been following my own guide off the internet. It was Sam's advice. Yeah. Going to push him. And accountability. You know, how you got yeah. on this week. He's checking me up on Strava. Mm. Uh, that sort of virtual PT. Accountability. Yeah, accountability. Yeah, that's important. What helped as well. I think if, you know, when you're doing it off your own plan, it's easy to just go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. David mentioned about, um, you know, don't beat yourself up if you get injured or get ill. Yeah. What should you do, for example, you know, we're in the, the middle of winter now, yeah. uh, and you catch a cold or, uh, you know, you sprain your ankle. What Can you can you train for a cold? Is it okay to do that? Like go for a run even though you've got a snotty nose? Yeah, I generally say if it's if it's just a, a head cold, it's okay. If it's any kind of wear below, below your neck, if you feel just cold and shivering, you know, general flu symptoms, then I wouldn't go out and train. But I'm a bit of a, a little bugger. I, I don't like to miss sessions. Um, so if I'm really ill, sometimes I'll just completely rest and not and not train that day and try and do it the next day or whatever and see how I feel. If it's just head cold, a bit of a headache, then sometimes you actually feel better from going out and training. And weirdly, what I found, the healthier I got, the less ill I became. Yeah. So, you know, you got to the point where you just... Fresh air, and yeah. good food. So by keeping you fit, you When I was four and a half stone heavy, I was always getting colds and ill and feeling lethargic and I just yeah. rarely get ill. Yeah. No. So you would say it's our duty as citizens to keep fit and keep you straight back off your politics <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions for, for Sam? I don't think so. I can't think of anything else. No, well, if you've got any more questions, pop them in the comments below uh, and obviously... We'll ask Sam, we'll come onto the channel and answer them for you and always help you out. Because as a new newbie to Ironman, there are a lot billion and one questions going through your head. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're at Staffordshire this year watching the Ironman, 
Watch out for Way. He's the one with the big sign that says Vote Way. Yeah, yeah high Sam, five. Are you, are you running this year? Yeah. Stuff to you? He'll yeah. be handing out business cards. <laughs> BPM. I'll be racing. Yeah. And handing out business cards. <laughs> At the same time. I'll be yeah. on his uh, back. He'll be giving me a piggyback, back, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're doing a little tandem, aren't we? Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Me and Cooper will be there filming. Supporting Way. Supporting yeah. and cheering yeah. you both on. And yeah, it'll be good fun. Thanks for watching. Peace. Of course, I should run it